Well, for those of you who are not familiar with the expression existential risk, there may be a few. An existential risk is a risk to life on our planet. Can you hear okay, by the way? Is it clear? Good. Excellent. So, my argument is that we as scientists have a duty to reduce existential risk wherever we can. We are victims of our own greed, of our own selfish instincts and so on. And, but science, as science, we are kind of like a, a technological priesthood in some way. And we should not be elitist in our approach to what we do and always think of the impact of what we do on humanity. So this crowd here in front of me, you represent maverick science. Um, <laughs> Mavericks, of course, are the, the lonely, very often steers that hang around the outside of the herd and warn the herd of approaching danger. And I think we have a duty to do this to a certain extent. So this outsider status, sometimes it's viewed as a problem, but actually it can also be useful because we are not necessarily enmeshed uh, in the political machinations of the world. We would quite like to be in some instances because that seems like a route to respectability and to funding. But I think as a group, it's possibly time we change not what we do, not our work, but how we describe it to the outside world, how we label it and so on. And potentially reawaken interest and open up new sources of support from risk-aware individuals, from governments perhaps, because we face risks. What are they? This is, uh, some of this will be familiar territory of course, because we're all intelligent people, we read the papers and so on. Um, here's one, this is a UN project, uh, projection, very recent, of global population, and you see by approaching the end of this century, we're looking at, in the worst case, more than double the current population of the planet. It has been suggested that we already use the resources equivalent to about one and a half planets. <laughs> We're actually using the resources half more of a planet Earth than we actually have already. So by the end of the century, it looks like we would need three planets to, to live at the, even at the level which we live now. We live very comfortably, but of course you realize that <laughs> we do better than most. Artificial intelligence represents another risk. I won't dwell on this, but I would just like to point out that on the left-hand side of the uh, image there is a neural network designed by a human being. On the right-hand side is a neuro neural network that's designed by an AI. If you ask a human coder, a circuit designer, to justify the, the AI design circuit, he said, well, I can see how it works, but I don't know why it works like that. But they are more efficient. They are more efficient, and Google are doing this now. They're moving on generation after generation, thousands of iterations of neural nets capable of discriminating thousands of different things. And it is their hope to combine them and make human level or human plus level AI very, very soon, much sooner than we anticipated. AI seem to be stalled for years. Another aspect of this is that AI offers us enormous possibilities um, in terms of autonomous vehicles. This is a big one. Um, and some serious, serious uh, observers of, of the market, of the whole uh, AI scene, su suggest that by 2030, which is only 13 years away, there will hardly be any private cars. The cars will belong to fleets, that you'll order a car when you want to go somewhere, it will take you and it won't have a driver. This has a tremendous impact on, on unemployment. Um, and if you look here, also a tremendous impact on the oil market. You can see there the, um, the oil demand forecast declines because these autonomous vehicles will be in the main electric. And uh, this change in the whole structure of the sector of the economy will cause the loss of many, many legacy assets. And, but also, at the same time, it will create trillions and trillions of dollars in new business opportunities and growth. And for that reason alone, it will happen. 
just because we talk about, you know, oh, well, LNR, LENR is, is disruptive, it, it won't happen, people won't allow it to happen. That one's going to happen, that's for sure, because there is much money to be made. Um, and real AI will only not merely displace driving and, uh, and professional go playing, of course, will come to an end. But um, it's going to be jobs in the law, jobs in finance, all kinds of things, factory jobs, warehouse jobs. And so there will be a need to introduce a, perhaps a basic wage for everybody, whether they work or not. But at the end of this, I, this, I would just say, remember, Greeks bearing gifts. These things happen. We welcome them into our lives. They say, this is wonderful, how cool this is. And we buy it, we create a market, and maybe, you know, everything has unintended consequences. By the way, people do say that we couldn't afford to have a fleet of electric cars, but this uh, little graph here shows the additional demand on the current power grid of an entire national fleet of autonomous vehicles. And uh, because these cars will be intelligent, they'll know, when, they'll know when to charge themselves up and how to pick off peak electricity. So it amounts at most of perhaps 18% of current electrical demand will be met by... Uh, uh, well, you could serve an electric, an electric America could run <laughs> entirely off the existing power supply. So, can we use Lenar to engineer our way, from, way uh, from underneath the problems we're in? Possibly not. Everything that mankind has done so far in terms of serious technological change has had unintended consequences. Uh, for example, the improvements in public health that drainage and clean water brought about produced a tre tremendous upsurge in the population. Um, improvements in agriculture did the same thing. Uh, these are all good, they're all good, but they have unintended consequences. And um, other things, uh, Rachel Carson, famous book of the 60s, um, Silent Spring, was about the impact of pesticides on the American environment in particular the American environment and on wildlife and so on. And Philip Slater's Earthwalk is another book which is a little bit dated now, but I would recommend it as a read. They point out the folly of believing we can just engineer our way out of trouble. So my argument is, however, that contrary to this experience, Lenar offers a potential remedy and a potent defense against known and unknown existential risk, because we cannot know them all, but particularly those resulting from climate change, from habitat loss, ecosystem collapse, overpopulation. And by the way, yes, keeping the lights on doesn't stop people having babies. No. <laughs> right, okay, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just let you look at this for a moment. This describes an ideal Lenar system. I think there are a couple, Mike's talked about this, I know, he, 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 knows, he knows more than me about it, you know. Um, he knows more than almost anybody, but it should be distributed system. We need a distributed power generation system. Centralised systems, the grid, are too fragile, really, they're too fragile. And uh, a distributed system obviously is more resilient and... Uh, will be good for earthquakes and disasters and asteroid strikes and it would help a lot. And point number five, it must be zero carbon, zero emission. Um, I can't see why it would not be, but it's very important. There are also, I've been thinking about some of the objections and I class objections of two kinds. Um, I'm not going to describe them all, but there are the reflexive objections that people have. As soon as you mention cold fusion, they say, oh gosh, what ridiculous nonsense. That is a reflexive objection. When you hear the reflective objections, you know by then that the people you're talking to have actually thought about it a little bit. And um, they mention the uh, economic disruption. My answer to that is we are going to get disrupted over the next 20 or 30 years like you cannot believe. I'll give you a little example of things that we don't even know about. A friend of mine works for Guido Industries in China. They're working on the M-Drive project. He phoned me up and said, Alan, what can you tell me about the LENR business at the minute? I really, really need a power source because we've got this baby up to 25 newtons per kilowatt now. 
they have a self-lifting hovering platform. They don't, they don't talk about it. This is, this is supposed to be a secret, and I know you will never ever tell anybody. But <laughs> it just goes to show. Disruptions are coming. We haven't even thought about them. The last one. If everybody in the globe had access to energy, it would fry the planet. Well, the figures are there. Nonsense. We could produce 20 times the, the electricity we produce now. It would make hardly any difference of itself. Um, the things we do already are more disruptive. There, for example, is a graph showing the effect of just human population in a, in a small growing town in America on the temperature on still evenings. And you can see it goes up where, where it goes up from a, a thousand people to 10,000 people and so on. It's quite old data, but I just think it's a beautiful uh, example of good data on a mesoclimatic change, a man-made change, just by living together in a little town. So the world's going to need more, more air con, con for sure. And this one also important. Let's skip this. Wars, terrorism, who needs it? This is the, uh, really the key thing as far as I, in my opinion. I did a, a cost, being a businessman, <laughs> sort of, I did a cost-benefit analysis. And if you look on, on the left-hand column there, there are the risks, you know, pandemic, solar flares, global war, the, the little things that happen every day. On the right-hand side, there are, there are a couple of columns. There's the benefit and there's the harm. And the very last column on the right, I have balanced the, the, the benefit. I did the calculation and I think the benefits of a distributed, clean Lennar system outweigh the harm by a factor of about seven. Just very briefly on, on the military one, I think, I think <laughs> this may be one reason why people don't like it, it evens up the balance. Yeah, um, Wars have been fought over resources, wars have been fought over access to oil, of course. Um, and so nobody will fight for energy anymore, um, so that's, that's helpful. On the other hand, bad actors could use it to, uh, to rage war from remote regions, logistics gets easier and so on. I think, on the whole, possibly it's neutral. So, there you go. The benefits outweigh the advantages. The only problem is we don't have such a system. And, but we don't have the steak. We're not even sure what this magnificent steak feast might look like. But we should be selling the sizzle. Everybody I know of who works in this field has a little dream. We should talk about it more. We should sell the sizzle because we haven't got a steak. And by selling the sizzle, hopefully, we will create a climate where the funding will begin to flow and so on. Inspiring funders with the thought that long term, what we have is possibly the only way. And hang on, where, where are we going here? That's it. So reach out and build new audiences and new sources of support and so on. The tools to arouse public interest exist and new funding sources can be found. There are two and a half thousand billionaires in the world. I know that many of them are disinterested or suspicious of something which causes disruptive change, but as I said to you, we have these disruptive changes coming anyway. Somewhere amongst that two and a half thousand, there's got to be few who are good for a loan. Maybe you should think about asking them. Um, so we should maybe not change what we actually are doing, but <laughs> change how we do it, how we describe it is what I really mean. And there's some links there, but we won't worry about that now. And I want to mention this at the end. I and Sam here, we run the world's only cold fusion shop. We supply private investigators, private inventors really, and researchers. And just here um, is a calorimic calorimetric reactor I built. It's not a terribly good photograph. It, I never thought I would mention this. Um, but we have a very good system, a system which provides... What's, what's he on? Oh, is it, are you playing cards, Tom? Oh, well, very good, very good. You see, uh, that's just what I like to see. Um, this, this is um, <laughs> an isothermal reactor. Uh, with the possibility of a control system, a control port, a test port, and um, it's accurate to um, 
about one degree centigrade, a, 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 a thousand centigrade. So discrimination temperature wise, both ports, I can calibrate it and balance it to one degree and uh, possibly better than the thermocouples I'm using actually. I, but they appear to work. I swap them over and you, you know, this very flexible machine. It's basically a $500 differential scanning calorimeter. If you know where you can get a cheaper one, then <laughs> please let me know. Um, that doesn't include the power supply, by the way, but it, it does include a power supply, not that particular one. That's a two and a half kilowatt one. Um, anyway, and it only uses about 400 watts in total for both channels at 1,000 degrees. So, uh, and the difference at 1,000 degrees in electrical consumption is one watt. So I don't think we do too bad with that. And we would really like to help anybody here who's got what you might call hot, you know, hot fuel that they want to test any, in any regime up to about 1,000 degrees. I'm very comfortable working you know, at around that temperature. Um, we will be very happy to do it. And if you ask Sam, he, he might have a card left. Uh, supporting anybody. We also have lots of chemicals and even got some wire, got some really nice wire. Thank you very much everybody. Can I just say they genuinely mean that uh, they, they donated one of the uh, basic units to the MFMP and also the lithium, uh, nanoshell lithium that we got in, in Europe um, came from uh, looking for heat. So thank you very much. A couple of points on your presentation, if I can find them. Uh, the first one is that it's not just the drivers that are going to be out of business, it's the car manufacturers. because. One, one of them did a study and they looked at if they did pooling and staggering on, on a distributed car usage, uh, automat or, uh, automatic driving, they would only need to manufacture 3% of the current volume of cars. So there's a whole lot of embodied energy as well as the fuel use that would drop off the, <laughs> off the table. Um, the population average family size in Bangladesh is only 2.2 now. The last place on earth uh, really to have a boom is Africa and we just need to give them smartphones and the internet and then they'll give up. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of the existential risks for people just about in my age group, um, in, in the US prescription opiates now account for 55,000 deaths. Uh, it's the largest killer for people under 45. So. You could argue it's depression and just the pain of living, but <laughs> um, that, that's uh, my opinion on that. Yep, very, very true. Um, I, I said about us welcoming, uh, you know, what are actually bad actors into the world. Who would not have thought that opiate painkillers were not a good idea? Who, who would have said initially, Bicodin, terrible idea, but it causes terrible misery? Antibiotics also uh, have caused, caused, caused problems. They've saved our lives. They've saved millions of lives, but they are also beginning to cause problems. Every drug, and when I say drug, it's a very broad sense of drug, every drug contains the seeds, seeds of a new disease. This is the big problem, unintended consequences. Anybody, anybody else? Yeah, um, I, I have a thought for you as to what success uh, in an intermediate state uh, might look like in two different areas. Uh, I'm picturing what success in uh, academia uh, would look like. Uh, it, it would look like um, a, a, a colleague um, s stealing the approach, grabbing funding, sh shutting you out of funding, and having others work on it. That's, that's academic success in promulgating the uh, science to uh, the mainstream. Uh, and in, uh, in industry, the success looks like, uh, after a lot of work is done, of having uh, uh, perhaps a Chinese competitive company starting just to borrow some of the technology and mass produce it for a third the price that anyone can do it. So that's right. That, so that's only an unintended consequence, of course, for, an, for the original manufacturer. It's an intended consequence for the Chinese. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Okay, so quite um, I think. Wildest dreams. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> I think maybe we should come to an end because if Fab, if David, Fabrice David is here, he, I think he would like to speak for a few moments. Right. There he is.